All right. Um, so the next uh, next up is Richard Jefferson, um, who is going to be telling us about the Cambio uh, lens. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm told I only have a few minutes for this, so I'm going to have to actually compress an awful lot of uh, our our thinking into some URLs, so that you can, if you wish to, spend more time there, uh, and if you don't wish to, you won't have to endure it here. Um, I don't write much, but what we do have is, is on a blog associated with our work product. So I'm going to start by giving you the first URLs, which are to Cambia.org. Cambia is the organization I set up about 20 years ago. Um, it has a very explicit purpose of, of shifting the demographics of problem solving. So that's our job, is to enlarge the scope of people and the type of people that can solve problems effectively using science and technology, ideally. The tools we've used to do that, to shift that demographic, uh, initially were scientific. And I was a molecular biologist uh, engaged in agriculture and worked very hard at trying to invent enabling technologies that would have a disruption on the status quo of invention. So to be able to provide uh, quite a large diversity of people with a toolkit that would allow them to bring local contextual knowledge and commitment to solving their problems in agriculture. It was uh, an academic success and a practical failure in that it turns out that in an innovation system, uh, it is almost never the science that is the rate limiting step. It was not in my field. It turned out that the rate limiting step to seeing social uh, upside to science is the quality of the embedding within the context of delivery and, and use. That is what we call an innovation system. All of the components that are necessary to turn an idea or an articulated need into a solution set. In the case of the drugs we're dealing with, it's, it's indeed having a particular target, a particular response molecule, a way of synthesizing it, a way of preparing it, a way of, of regulating it and testing it, delivering it, supporting it, and monitoring it. There's an entire complex system involved in that, including uh, delivery and access, which we have so, so few controls over. So, so I stepped back early in the career and said, is this actually, while it was very good for me, and I, I had a wonderful time inventing technologies and, and broadly providing them, what I used it for was as a classic scientific experiment. And those of you who are practicing scientists will recognize uh, easily and admit grudgingly that the most important science is the science that fails, <clears throat> but fails gracefully. Uh, it's the science that actually generates uh, chagrin in the scientist and progress in the field. Um, that is rarely shared among scientists, but it's cherished among uh, serious practitioners. Um, if you develop a hypothesis and expose it to criticism, to ridicule, to testing, God forbid, uh, and that hypothesis is overturned, it, it pushes the field dramatically. If it's reinforced, it does very little. So most bad science tries to find evidence to support a hypothesis. Most good science allows evidence to be developed to refute a hypothesis. Uh, what we did was articulated a particular strategy to uh, democratize science-enabled innovation, and it failed. And it failed in a way that taught us a great deal. It taught us a new point of intervention, so we went there. So some years ago, we started, quite a few years ago, a biological open source movement with the intention of um, trying to promote uh, more cooperative, more collective overcoming of not only the scientific and technical barriers, but uh, the actual innovation system barriers. That also was of limited success. So like a, a good but frustrated scientist, we looked hard at the reasons it was of limited success, which I don't have time to review here and recognize that, yet again, we could push the system outward and discovered that what we now feel is the single biggest contribution we could make is to destroy what we call information asymmetry, the inability of participants in the innovation system to de-risk their participation. So I want to take three minutes to use a metaphor because that's going to be able to do sort of the, the visual image, thousand words, and as Matthew knows, those thousand words from me can take so long. Um, so the visual image is this. And this is where Andrew's Dutch experience will come in helpful. Let me just see if I can find it. Um, da -ba -da -da, I got all these things called up so you can be chasing URLs all day. Um, where was it? Uh, are there more? I'm whipping, just don't, if there's somebody online is trying to follow this, don't. Somebody, somebody's taking, ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. Yes. Okay, what I'm going to talk about for about three or four minutes is a phenomenon I call innovation cartography. It's a meme that we've coined and are promoting that seems to be getting great traction. And it's a critical part that builds on Mary's expertise, and that is if you provide a compelling evidence base by which people can seek and find their own self-interest, 
Uh, there will be no excuse not to use it if it's a public uh, evidence base. It's something that's been lacking in policy for as long as we've had policy, which is quality guidance that is actually reproducible and verifiable. But it's also lacking in practice, which is one of the reasons we have a dysfunctional innovation system that celebrates very big ticket uh, solution sets, big market solution sets, and leaves most of the small ones, including those that are the subject of today's discussion, neglected. So we've looked at innovation system dysfunction and tried to understand through metaphors of history where a point of intervention may be, and it's innovation cartography. Almost all of civilization developed over the last 10,000 years because of trade. Uh, the ability to go and find something in one place and bring it to another place at which its value is higher, ideal, ideally higher. Um, if, it is, if there is a higher value, that creates a differential, that creates economies, that creates liquidity, that creates civilization. And all of civilization until recently was built on the back of trade. And the single most unheralded but most important component of trade is the single biggest tool to remove risk from trade, and that is the map. The map has been a huge driver for all of civilization. And again, as with science, one of the best ways to illustrate this is with its failure. So I'm going to describe in one minute or two minutes uh, a major historical event that occurred you know, over the course of 150 years and terminated in a highly abrupt disruption uh, that demonstrates my point. From the early 1400s till precisely 1596, maritime commerce was absolutely dominated by the Portuguese, and to some extent their allies, the Spanish, or the Catalans, if they're quibblers amongst you. Um, <laughs> when you have scholars, there will always be. Um, they actually had a lockdown on the craft of maritime cartography, the ability to navigate and the ability to accumulate and improve maps. They had publicly subsidized schools of cartography, uh, run by the, uh, the royalty of Portugal and endowed by the royalty of Portugal. They had norms and laws in which it was a capital offense to allow a map to fall into enemy hands because it was widely recognized that the map is the most important tool of trade. Not because it says where the good stuff is, it's because it says here there be dragons, here there be reefs, there are shoals, there, there are problems. And when you understand the constraints to trade, you have a better justification for investment in trade. So you could ease, more easily say, I need money to go find coconuts, or I'll find whatever you're going to say, and I have maps that will ensure that I'm not as likely to run aground as the other guys. Then it's a logical investment. So the map as a de-risking tool is extraordinarily important. But <clears throat> as you can imagine, if you send out surveyors and explorers, uh, those lucky ones that return will convey information that is accumulated onto that map. And the quality of the map is going to be dependent on the quality amount and interrelatedness, standardization, of the surveying points. Now, if you're one empire, the Portuguese empire, that means it's typically the Portuguese surveyors and explorers that you would encode on there. The other guys you couldn't actually accumulate their knowledge. And those of you who are thinking WikiLeaks, uh, you're thinking in terms of Wikipedia. Ah, okay. So, 1400s, it went roaring along. Now, what is the other consequence of a monopoly, which the Portuguese enjoyed, was abysmal incentive for competition, of course. So shipbuilding techniques were pathetic in the 1400s and early 1500s. There was very little improvement in that, very little improvement in navigation technology, very little improvement on legal and financial instruments because you didn't need to. What happened in 1596 was fascinating. A practical Dutchman, and I'm going to get it wrong, Andrew, but it's probably uh, Jan Huygens van Linschoten. Uh, close enough uh, for jazz. Okay, Jan Huygens van Linschoten was a very thoughtful, practical, and, well, actually, a practical Dutchman is sort of a re redundant statement, isn't it? Um, the Dutch, yeah, <laughs> so he was an extraordinarily skilled uh, business person, and he was working for the governor of Goa in India, who was, of course, Portuguese. And what should he discover stumbling across in the back rooms of the, of the uh, uh, governors? <laughs> rooms, but the entire uh, lore, the entire stock of Portuguese cartography information, all their maps, all their portland charts, their, their navigation instructions, and, and he did what a practical Dutchman would do. He copied them all uh, and then made an extraordinarily Indiana Jones-like journey back to Amsterdam via shipwrecks and all sorts of things um, and did what a surprising Dutchman would not normally do. So he did not sell it to a Dutch merchant house because it's enormously valuable. He did something shocking. He published it. 
He published it open access because this was before copyright existed, but it was after Gutenberg. So when he published it, everybody had it. That year, 1596, saw not only the publishing of all the Portuguese secret maps and charts, but also the formation of the Dutch East India Company, and shockingly, their bane, the British East India Company. So what happened was a massive disruption in competition in global maritime commerce caused by the wide and public availability of explicit de-risking tools, the maps of the world. And from that point on, massive increase in the innovation that occurred in shipbuilding, in navigation, and importantly, in insurance, in financial instruments, and investment instruments, because there was a good reason to. You might actually have success by mitigating failure. So innovation cartography recognizes that for 10,000 years, economic primacy was by moving stuff across space. It no longer is. The margins are small. Commodities are traded, indeed, but that's not what determines uh, economic primacy. We should listen to this as Australian policymakers. It's not moving stuff across space and burning it. It's actually through moving things to knowledge space and converting them. So the new, the new physical space is the mental space, the knowledge space. But all of the same metaphoric issues are there. Reefs, currents, shoals, straits, continents, seas, dragons. And they will always have dragons as long as we do not explore and do not share that knowledge. The challenge is this. We are now in a position that is sort of pre linskoten We are in a position where individuals that can afford to send out their surveyors and recruit the most highly paid surveyors of the knowledge space, typically patent attorneys, business intelligence professionals, using extraordinarily expensive facilities such as Thomson Reuters, LexisNexis, and many other gatekeepers to information, these wealthy merchant have enormous risks and enormous expenditures. And the only way they can justify those risks and those expenditures is to target big margin innovations, big market innovations. And all of the other ones that could be environmentally and socially robust languish, not because they're not solvable, but because the incentives to do so and the risks to do so don't balance. My sense is that what we need is a complete social revolution in innovation cartography, the ability to take what is currently information available and turn it into meaningful knowledge that can guide decisions by people that are not players in the system now. So we spent a, a lot of time working towards doing this innovation cartography, put our heads down the last three years, and built upon something um, that we worked on for about 10 years. We started with the patent lens. Now, I'm going to go back to Cambia. This is the institutional homepage, and you can find the URLs from this, or all except one, which I will give you that's the important one. Uh, three, four years ago, we developed this initiative for open innovation, not the way it's used by Innocentive you know, and others, but rather with the idea of making it a transparent and inclusive innovation system by which anyone who senses a problem or an opportunity has an opportunity as well to engage in that solution set. Uh, so the IOI, the Initiative for Open Innovation, actually Mary was there in the founding uh, International Advisory Council meeting in a rather bucolic setting up in Port Douglas, uh, was setting out specifically to disrupt the status quo in what's necessary about innovation cartography. And I'm going to talk only for a couple of minutes, and this is already waxing lyrical, about why patents are not the issue, but patents are an enormous part of the solution. Not because necessarily patents as legal tools are, but because it represents the largest body of technical knowledge in the history of our species, and we never treat it as such. So we have currently at Cambia four different streams of activity. One is the biological open source movement, which we put on ice because it was not going to go the place we wanted without the IOI and the lens. Patent lens for the last 10 or 12 years has been the most prominent public patent search tool in the world. If you put um, full text patent search into your Google text uh, or Google search bar, you get patent lens usually as number one or two. We've been duking it out with the US Patent and Trademark Office for three years, um, whom parenthetically we also work with. But patent lens has been very popular as a patent search site, but it isn't really a knowledge site. It doesn't allow people to create maps. It is, in effect, an acknowledgment that there are surveyed points that are out there, and people can go find the survey points, but it doesn't provide much help in assembling them into the decision support that we need. Patents, if you've ever had to read a patent, it's like saying, have you ever had root canal? Um, patents are an ugly, awful thing to read. They go through a remarkable formal kata-like dance between a patent attorney and the patent office that ultimately will almost certainly issue that patent, <laughs> uh, occasionally rejecting it through a process that's called final rejection, which is not, in fact, final. Uh, if you push hard enough, you will get a patent. Um, in South Africa, there are patents on the wheel, on fire, countless things. Anyway, the patent document is miserable to read. 
The aggregate of many patent documents is a living hell, so people don't go there. Virtually no academics read the patent literature uh, in any country in the world. And yet, within the corpus of patent documents, which is now more than 80 million documents, is most of the technological lore that has given us modern economies that are based on knowledge. Everything from inventions in food processing to energy storage devices to energy harvesting devices to, in fact, drugs for a variety of diseases and, importantly, techniques to turn them into reality, not simply the techniques to find leads. So the patent system is an enormous resource. Can we make it, instead of root canal, can we make it something that's invigorating and interesting and, and inspiring to people to read? And can we use its front page as an entryway into the world of innovation? Because, in fact, patents are just a part of the puzzle. If you consider innovation, per se, the way an economist uses it, not as a smart new thought, but as something that reaches the marketplace and can be tested and, and provided to human beings and real economies, um, that innovation requires a jigsaw. So my last physical, visual metaphor is that. Think of an innovation, whether it's a solution to a malaria or a partial solution to malaria or the preparation of a, of a veneer that goes on top of this furniture. It requires the assembly of, assembly of many pieces in a jigsaw. So let's think about why does a jigsaw puzzle work. Any of you who have children will have certainly endured many, many jigsaw puzzles. Um, if you're about to have children, plan on enduring many jigsaw puzzles. Don't lose the box. The box is the start of a jigsaw puzzle. If you cannot envision what you're about to assemble, you have no hope. Imagine someone gives you a baggie, a, a bag full of jigsaw puzzle pieces and doesn't tell you what it is and says, assemble it. You think, ah, impossibly difficult. So the first thing that makes a jigsaw puzzle work is the ability to visualize it. It doesn't have to be complete, but more or less you see on the box stuff what you're making. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a Sydney Opera House. Okay, you have some idea what you're trying to assemble. That's critically important. But you open the box, what do you assume? You assume that it's comprehensive, that the pieces are either there or could be there with a little bit of pen and ink if you don't have them. It's critical. So it's visualizable, it's comprehensive. Another really important, it's got to be bounded. It's, you've got to have starting points. Everyone who does the jigsaw puzzle starts on the corners and the, and the edges. It's, oh, it's the flat stuff. And you build in from something you can do. Every innovation has to start with something doable. The final point that makes them work is they're standardized. It turns out there's not a thousand shapes in jigsaw puzzle. There might be six or seven. But it's not that difficult. The number of shapes is comprehensible because you can put them together. Standardization matters. So these four features, visualizability, comprehensiveness, boundedness, and standardizability makes a jigsaw puzzle work. And that's what makes an innovation work. And the reason we have such an incredibly exclusive and unpleasant innovation system that is not democratic and not engaging of the creativity of our species is because we do not meet these four requirements almost intentionally. So I'll talk now for a couple of minutes. See, I always keep saying a couple of minutes, 10 minutes later, about our contribution to this. If you look at Wikipedia, what you see is an example of beginning to open the doors to many people's contributions, typically around fields of knowledge that do not require massive surveying of the world. This is one of the differences between what we're doing and Wikipedia and one of the important similarities. The similarity is the recognition that there are many people with substantial shared interests to remove risks. Okay? Risks being the unknown. The difference is we have the largest body of knowledge in the world to navigate. That knowledge includes legal rights to exclude, but more importantly, patents are used as the right to frighten. So remembering that a patent is not a right to do anything. It's a right to sue. So if you take on something, a right to sue, not a right to do, that's a patent. Uh, that's the solution. So here it is. There are currently about 80 to 100 million patent documents around the world. Um, the important thing is that they are public documents. In the United States, as an example, they're not even subject to copyright. So the largest non-copyrighted technical resource in the history of our species is the US patent system. But parenthetically, the European uh, Japanese patent systems have similar degrees of openness, and most of them uh, do as well. Now, what does that mean? It means we have to assemble that as an enormous knowledge resource, but then begin to annotate it in a way that we can turn those survey points into practical guides for innovation that will dictate the who, which, when, where, why, and what of innovation. So do you remember when journalism actually existed as a profession and there were these Jonah Jameson-like uh, city editors, kid, go out there and get the story and don't come back to you give me the five W's. You know, the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, so if you come back with a story of the five W's, you'd have a story that meant something you could publish. The same is true with innovation. You have to know all these things. Who are the players, right? When are they action? 
uh, where are there is are there influences? What are their rights and what are their substantial contributions? And whatever the other one is. Well, I've added the sort of the non Mitt Romney one, which is I don't think that people are corporations. So we added a which. Luckily, it starts with a W. So there's six of our Ws. We have to understand them all, and people need to annotate these documents to have that. The front page of a patent are all of the leads into that. It says who came up with the idea, the author, the scholar, the inventor, which entity now seeks to acquire the rights and to wield them in various ways, where are those rights being sought, where they're being exercised, uh, when is the invention and the scale of its rights being exercised, what is the subject matter, and the why is the business strategy, why they're even doing it. These all exist, or at least they're teased at at the beginning of a patent document. So by developing a, a global cyber infrastructure, we can start assembling this and integrating business data, scholarly literature, and using the patent data as the corpus from which we can start annotating, amending, and sharing. So we've developed something. This is in prototype. So if you use this URL, please don't forward it to others. It's beta.patentlens.net. Uh, if you want to really have some fun, go to the one that says test.patentlens.net, which is the one that we use as a staging area to push all the new features. Uh, we now have about 80 million patent documents in here with full faceting. And I'll give you an example by using malaria. Uh, um, in this set, we happen to have 37,000 patent documents with returns for malaria. We also have three entry points. We have the largest biological sequence capability on the planet. We've extracted a huge number of proteins, RNA, and DNA sequences that are described in patents. Uh, very few of them are protected through patent claims, but mostly are described. They're teachings. Um, and you can search by similarity, by species, and I'll go through that if I had the time. Which I don't, but I'll do it later. Um, there's an advanced search where you can narrow it all down. But another tool that's really critical is we provide facets. Let me give you an example. Of these 37,000, all of these features, one can simply scan through. Let's look at applicants. By going there, you can modify that, include or exclude ones. And with a single click, you want to look at Squibb, Bristol Myers Company. With a single click, you're actually filtering these 37,000 into 397 by that uh, applicant. Similarly, if you want to see what jurisdiction you can look at it there and see where they are playing. Most of them, the US, uh, international application, European, and Canada. Curious. So when someone says there are patents in all these developing countries, I would hesitate to say that that's true. In fact, I would certainly say it's not. Uh, but the lack of evidence also encourages fear in investors. The solutions to most of the problems of malaria, malnutrition, come in the areas that feel these uh, problems, these insults. So we need to encourage local scale innovation and investment where there's self-interest or there's skin in the game. What we have to do is ensure that the creative people of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, wherever there are problems of this sort, have as much clarity as they can possibly bear to justify to an investor, whether that's the government or an assembly of local banks, that they can find social value in an investment. So this is the beginning of that process. And I hope you play with it a little bit. Um, as you'll see, there are three different views, the list view, the, the uh, basically the summary view and the analytic view. Okay, you can go through any of these, modify, search, and here's the important point: you can look at any one of these documents. Let's go back and find an interesting one. Okay, here that's one that has lots of language I don't understand. So Matthew will be happy with this one since I, I don't even know what these things are. Um, oh yeah, they're aeroketone pyrrolytrazine stuff. Um, what's interesting about this? is you can look at the full text of it, and you begin to understand the scope of the interesting issue from an informatics point of view. This is how the USPTO provides the data to the world. And this is actually industry best standard, gold, gold standard. It's a stream of ASCII text. It's largely useless as a human readable knowledge document. It's been written with substantially twisted and tortured language by legal practitioners to ensure that it's clerical. It's got ecclesiastical norms and ecclesiastical tools. What we have to do is create a schema by which the global patent literature becomes uh, a teaching document. It's knowledgeable, like e-publishing does with modern publishing. Make it such that figures are embedded properly for inspection at the place where they occur. Callouts to other related information. Have you considered this? Did you think of this? Oh, you want to learn about this? To have in the background of the document dictionaries, thesauruses, and, and context-specific help that help you as an inventor or as a thoughtful person, understand the scope of this document and the teachings therein. So we're going to do that with help from Moore Foundation and so far with help from Gates Foundation, ironically. Um, so we've also done something in collaboration with the US National Institutes of Health. One of the features about patent applications is that you must teach 
the public not only what you have done, but tell them what other people have done that would otherwise read on it. Now, of course, there's some artifice in this, but they do that. There are non-patent publications. So working with the NCBI and a group called Crossref, we've gone through the 17 million non-patent literature citations in the global patent corpus. So far, we've got about 5 million of them marked up and hot-linked out to the primary literature. So you can go and read the document in open access if it's available, or at PubMed if that's all that's available. That's still marvelous. So we're working on that, and that's been a fabulous tool. Family information is critical, really critical. One invention conceived of in Sydney may actually be the genesis of hundreds and hundreds of patent applications that are derivative of that invention in many other countries in the world. What we've done is got family information so we can actually look at the documents in these different countries to find out what their legal status is, what they teach, what they disclose, and what they don't. We also have, and if I go to the one of the other ones I told you I was going to irritate you with, this. Um, the entire patent corpus can now be translated into whatever you like, um, which is a very useful tool. Thank you to ARPA, ARPA. Please, Lord, let it actually have done so. It's not doing that. One second. Is it not translating? God, uh, do I show it off in the alpha? Is that German? Is the URL being blocked somehow? Oh, uh, using Google. ARPA, in other words, the one that uh, the U.S. government funded. That Google stole. Oh, that's it. Sorry. That's the, that's the test. No, it's probably test. It's just down for a day. They're fixing something. Use it on test if you want. Okay, but the most important feature of all of this isn't the formidable cyber infrastructure that incorporates the world's patents and integrates it with the world's science. It's the fact that it integrates it with the world's people. So one of the things we can do, and it's the first time ever for patents, is we can stop the nonsense and the rhetoric and the ideology and support it with evidence. So from now on, every single patent search that anyone does, every single annotation, oh, I forgot to mention that critical point, you can actually go through here and annotate, put a note against any part of any patent, against the abstract claims, the people, the classification, document history, document family. You can make collections. You can, with a single click, share it to your Facebook site. Let's imagine you have a malaria drug, you probably do, a Facebook community or some other tool for that. With a single click, you can make a collection that is relevant to you and the community in which you work, share it to that collection, which they, with a single click, can validate and verify at the primary data source. And they can annotate and amusingly add things to it. So collecting, sharing is critical. Annotation is critical. But here's the part that I think I'm most excited about. Embedding. What we've done now is al allow all of our APIs to be exposed with what are called JavaScript queries. So every single analysis you do, should you choose to, can be embedded in any HTML delivered site. It can be embedded in an intranet, in a blog. This is a WordPress blog of mine. Okay. This adenovirus delivery or these transformation applicants is actually a hot link. So watch. This is in my blog. It's a really pretty graph. But unlike the usual ones, if you read, people make an assertion. They say, this is the case. Oh, I hate patents. And look at these horrible ones by Monsanto. All you have to do is click and say, well, wait a minute. Was the data supporting that? This is taking you back to the lens. You look at the nature of the collection, the constraints put upon it, uh, the analysis that was conducted. And you can say, yes, that's a supportable uh, uh, conclusion, or no, it's not. And if it's not, you can improve it. The embedding means that the entire community now can access all the data, but more importantly, they have no excuse not to. And if they make a statement about intellectual property, if they make a statement about innovation cartography, where the user cannot go back to the primary data, they are now disabused, they are abusing the system. So just like primary science progresses by providing the data to people to verify, validate, or disprove the hypothesis, we have to do the same in innovation cartography. And so in the beta of this, we've done that. So if we go, as an example, to this collection on adenovirus, we can now hit the embed button. We get embed code for an iframe. Cut and paste this. In the next few months, it'll just be drag and drop into your blog. You now have shared the comprehensive analysis that you have done with primary data with everyone in the world. If you're a company, you put this on your intranet. And you and all your lawyers and all of your CSIRO, <laughs> I, I appreciated that comment a lot, CSIRO colleagues can actually now mine it for, for greenfield running places or, or dark field uh, licensing places. So this has been done because we established, ironically, a landscape around malaria. So this is the last of it, and I will quit now. Um, what we did was, with the Gates Foundation was fascinated by this because in spite of some of the comments about the Gates Foundation, Luigi, one of the things they absolutely insist is that there's a global access plan. They will not give you money until you articulate a global access plan how your work can find itself to its intended beneficiaries. So countless people have not gotten funding until they articulate 
a plan by which their science can be delivered into a vaccine or a drug or a crop or whatever else because they say if it doesn't get to poor people who are afflicted by the disease or the malnourishment or whatever else, we have failed. It's sort of a business rule. If you don't get a product, you failed, and that's the case in philanthropy too. So this global access plan can take many forms. But one of them was you should show clearly what impediments there are to the delivery of this to the world and what partnerships are appropriate for the delivery to the world. So they've done that, and they funded us for the last few years to do this, both their global health and their agriculture program. And I don't think they intended to have it as disruptive as it is. Uh, but there's been a huge breakthrough in the last month at the Gates Foundation, two months. They've appointed probably the most decent, visionary, impressive human being I've ever known in my life to actually lead their global development team. I don't know how he made it past the HR qualifications. But uh, it's going to signal an enormous change uh, at the Foundation's practical level unless he gets shot by Bill. Um, anyway, Chris Elias. Uh, I would I, walk on coals for him. He's been the, the last 10 years, he's been the head of PATH, which is an enormously impressive uh, social enterprise uh, that built up from being a 30 million a year to a 300 million, that's the input side, uh, to also delivering RTSS and a variety of other, well, not that one exactly, but many other successful vaccines, therapeutics, devices, interventions for global public health. They do it because they use the, the practical tools of the private sector, meaning management discipline, extraordinary focus on deliverables, with the philanthropic goals of a social enterprise. It's a phenomenal organization, and he brought it up to speed. Uh, he's a great guy. He's now the president of Global Development at Gates. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that the way we developed the lens was what's called agile development. Now, agile development in the software industry usually means a very uh, potentially fractious way of interacting between different community sets. Often one of them would be the user, the other would be an engineer. But we did the worst form of that. We got a really top quality professional patent attorney from Big Pharma, somebody who used to run IP for Shire and Biochem Pharma, parenthetically, which had the, uh, the patent rights over 3TC, uh, one of the most important early uh, antiretroviral drugs. What's that? She isn't as of last week. Uh, maybe, maybe now she's joined up. That's interesting. Um, at any rate, Shona uh, came up to Brisbane where we had relocated for a while and was thrown into the lion's den of software engineers. And she, she was told, develop a landscape about malaria vaccine, not because it was contentious, but because it was kind of worked out by a lot of the players who were doing it. And we wanted to see if we could push it and develop a new landscape. So she was talking directly to the engineers. And she'd say, I need this data. I need to be able to assemble it this way. And they'd say, but we can't. And they'd pull out their hair. Voila. And, and they couldn't do it until she said, but I have to do it. I can't do it. I have to do it. Ultimately, that resolves somehow. And of course, it always resolves in the form that the engineers do the work. Um, and so the lens was built because we had someone who was deeply frustrated by what was not available. Um, because I said, you can't use Thompson Reuters for this. You have to use a resource that we build. And they built it. Uh, the real landscape is this one. And it's not pretty because we have it in a, in a bad content management system. Um, you can access it by searching for malaria on the lens and then clicking on the landscape. But it's going to look really different in a couple of months as we rebuild it. But the basic idea is all the vaccine candidates are here, the adjuvants, the antigens, the delivery, and a substantial analysis on not only the patent uh, situation on those, but actually a human knowledge enriched um, set of these. So you can actually go through and look at the jurisdictions, the timelines, the applicants, the inventors, all of these things reviews and links out to the scientific stuff, but you can also look at development timelines, which are critically important, and incorporate much more than just patents. So for instance, here you'll have uh, trials, whoops, sorry. you'll have trial events, you'll have, um, and you can actually hopefully reference most of the documents and the linkages to these. So you can actually look at this through conventional JavaScript tools, you can look, inspect, and later on you'll be able to even amend with curated uh, permissions. So this is going to look much more like uh, let's see if I can find it somewhere up here. Yeah, that's, that's this in due course because we're now rebuilding our, our landscaping architecture so that it's actually not only beautiful but deeply enriched with JavaScript tools so everyone can embed analyses. There will be, of course, fine-grained permissions. There will be curation tools, uh, reputational tools, and these will be credible analyses. Um, this whole approach of developing maps, you should remember, is not as overwhelming as it sounds. If you're going into one particular port as a sailor, what you need is detailed soundings of that port. And you care very, very little about comprehensive soundings of the rest of the world. It's about the area in which you sail. So consequently, maps of the natural world were not developed by somebody saying, I have to understand 
the entire cartography of the world. Nonsense. If they wanted to trade in the country next door or in that port or whatever else, they would ensure that they surveyed that part. But in the aggregate, we develop an understanding of the world. So harnessing the self-interest of people wanting to render clarity over key areas, whether it's malaria pharmaceuticals, to understand who can you participate with, who can you learn from. And the patent literature is rich with learning, just hidden in horrible language. Uh, we will then be able to build communities of action that can solve problems. It turns out that the vast majority of the world's patents are not enforced. Even the ones that could be enforced have lapsed because of non-payment of annuities. Patents not only are expensive to get, as was alluded before, they're expensive to maintain. And most applicants for patents abandon them. When they abandon them, that particular work product is in the public domain. But that just means you can't be sued for using it. It doesn't mean you can't use it, that you can use it. So we have to get this innovation cartography meme wildly popular, and it will be. We haven't gone live with this. You're almost the first group to ever hear about this. We expect three or four months from now to go live with a public launch of the, of the lens. You're welcome to try it and give us feedback if you want. Uh, there will be problems. There will be bugs. There are insufficiencies. We think in the next nine, well, probably a year and a half, we'll have the entire Chinese, Japanese, and Korean data sets as well, which will compromise, comprise, compromise us. Yeah, it will. It'll also comprise about 80, 90 percent of the world's patents. We have relationships with many patent offices who are providing primary data to us to incorporate in the lens. The Canadians have been wonderful. The Germans are wonderful. Uh, the Chinese are trying to screw us for $400,000 for the patent set, but we have friends at high places, so we're trying to lubricate that a bit. Uh, Japanese are great. They've been saying, we love you, and never, ever sending us the data for years. Um, but we'll get it all. And if we have to buy it, we'll buy it. But then we'll have all the world's patents. But then working with NCBI, Crossref, and others, we'll have access to the open, uh, open access and the primary literature. Then the business literature. So that's going to be where it's going to get really tough. Um, legal entity identifiers uh, are going to be one of the big challenges over the next three or four years. So we know what every company is in the world. But we don't now. If, if you were to ask GlaxoSmithKline, who are, who are the companies that constitute your group, they actually can't answer very easily. It's extremely difficult to know what legal entities are owned or controlled, even within that entity. So if you've ever seen mergers where everybody goes dark off the radar for about a year or two, it's because they're trying to digest the beast. Uh, it's like a python after a meal. So we need that information. We're going to do it collectively. So take a look at the lens. Have some fun with it. Poke and prod. Uh, Luigi, play with the, the sequence stuff. See if you can find all sorts of stuff that we don't anticipate in there. And take a look at some of our prototype landscapes we've got even on our old site. And feel free to contact me if you want. But the, the basic story is this. Um, Solutions to serious problems are going to come from people who feel and experience the problems themselves. Um, they're not going to come from guys with my general albedo and income. Uh, however, I can be and you can be effective at removing constraints uh, from other people. So the biggest role I think I can have in my life is to collectively, uh, with others, uh, enable the removing of barriers to other people's creativity. And I think that using a cyber infrastructure and the philosophies of open source and wiki but with the practical realities of, of innovation system reform, we're going to do that in our li working lifetimes. And it's an enormously exciting time. And uh, so take a look at our site and uh, have some fun. Thank you. Great. And that's questions, I'll take questions. That's fantastic. Um, I had a couple, two quick questions. First is, um, what are the chances that you will in, include chemical structure searching? The chances are 100%. OK. The right. timeline is, is debatable. Yeah, right. No, it's difficult. Um, no, it's, it's, no, what's interesting is, the community you live within has huge goodwill. The academic chemistry community is phenomenally interesting, and they're rebelling against the ACS, uh, this nonprofit that basically has a chokehold on chemical entity identification. Uh, PubMed or PubChem and the NCBI, and many, many academics, you know, Murray Rust and people like that. There is so much goodwill. What we have to do is take these complex work units and patents, which in include chem draw files and everything else, develop open source parsers, and allow the searching and, and, and annotation and sharing of those chemicals. Uh, but the goodwill is fantastic in the public sector. So once we have the cyber infrastructure, that's very high priority for us, really high. I had another quick question, which is, um, it's a basic question. So if if we uh, worked on a uh, an anti-malarial, and if we find by doing a search that the class of compounds that we're looking at is covered by some patent that is operational in Australia, what do we do? Are we, are we forbidden from researching that, or, or are we just forbidden from making money off of that in Australia? Well, as, as Luigi pointed out, there is a, a potential sea change in the works. Uh, that's actually been, been approved, that that legislation is going through for the research exemption. It's still, yeah, that's just that one. Oh. 
problem with the proposed the problem with the proposed research exemption is that it's so narrow that it really won't have any practical effect. Okay. I mean, I mean, other than pure research, and who does pure research anymore? Um, it's just not. Well, okay. It's no, no. I take your point. You, you know what I mean? It's it's just the the the, the real the problem is that the world's changed. We, we no longer have the institutions that are based on pure research. Everything is linked to a commercial venture. That, that's quite right. You know, when you have SID innovate and they have interest. But so, may, may I ask, the, the actual practical answer to your question is, no, you're not forbidden on it. A patent is, when it's a right to sue, it's also an obligation for the patent holder to exercise those rights. There's no criminal police about patents in almost any jurisdiction. There's no jackbooted enforcement police that are going to knock down your door in patents. So the issue is, if there is a patent held by a company, let us imagine it's a big company, the, the onus is on them to find you, first of all, and to exercise through a cease and desist letter or later on suits um, their rights to, to stop you from doing what you do. The, there's no big upside for them to do that. Pa but patents are generally jealously guarded by most companies as a tool for what was alluded to earlier, stewardship of brand. Brand exposure is the biggest problem right now in an awful lot of uh, enterprises, whether they be iPhone, if you've been reading about that, uh, or any other sort of trademark or brand. And so people use patents and denial of permission as much as anything else is to guard their uh, accountability for their work product. Um, it's, it's a complicated world, but basically, no. You're not going to be uh, criminally liable and un highly unlikely that you're ever going to be called to task for it. I mean, basically, every university in the United States, for instance, is massively infringing because the research exemption is, is quite uh, mythical. Uh, they, they are all infringing every day and in fact it's generally in the best interest of the patent holders because they further reduce to practice the ideas, they develop applications which can then be commercialized under the rubric of that patent right. So you're okay. But the, I mean, the, the, sorry, the, the, <laughs> the, the chemical search thing would just be so useful because that, um, if that's visual, then, then as, a, as a map making tool it's very easy then to see what hasn't been mapped, right? So then you could, you could very easily spot the kinds of chemical structures related to the ones you might be working on, yeah. which no one has ever mentioned in a patent. And mm. immediately that tells you, okay, well, well, we should be going in that area perhaps, yeah. because no one's looked at those things. I mean, that'd be very, that'd be very valuable. Well, parenthetically, some, when, I say, when I respond to that, somebody will say, oh yeah, then, then the companies are gonna see these, these white spaces and fill them in with their own patents. But the truth is, the big companies, first of all, they're all busy trying to make some money. Second, uh, they already can do this. <laughs> and they have a lot of money and a lot of people. But I'll give you something that's really exciting about this. This is an open source project, the Lens, but it's open source the wise way. What we're doing is saying to companies who need firewall protection for their searches, sure, you can license the Lens and totally internalize it as an appliance inside of Merck or inside of, in fact, Merck is negotiating. You can totally internalize it and ask your own questions behind the secrecy of Merck's walls by taking an open source license. So if you improve the software, everybody benefits. All they get is their confidentiality, which they're going to exercise anyway. The rest of the community gets the search tools. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cluey business model where we can actually cater to the need for privacy. In fact, patent offices want this for, for examination tool because they don't have good examination tools, it turns out. But they also have a firewall need. So if they fund us, okay, we develop it and we give them permission to put it behind a firewall for their own confidentiality purposes, I don't care. They're, you know, they're going to do it anyway. Just now they'll do it better and they'll fund a public resource. So there's lots of interesting business models that will make this not a white elephant. I just wanted to augment something Richard just said. In terms of criminalizing uh, patent infringement, that's true at the present moment. It's not a criminal infringement. There are developments in this area. The anti-counterfeiting trade agreement potentially has the capacity to introduce criminalizing criminalization for intellect for, for patent of the problems that we, we, we currently have to deal with. Keep an eye on that. There, you need to be aware of these developments. Uh, and uh, the United States and the European Union are very keen to ratchet up the enforcement uh, systems. Parenthetically, Luigi, I wanted to show you this because you're a, a scholar who spends a lot of time thinking about this. One of the things we've done is mined all of the sequences in the, the beta databases. They're not publicly available, most of them. None of the US applications which constitute Billions of base pairs are searchable in the public. They're not in GenBank. We've managed to put all these in here, but we've also managed to run them against what's called RefSeq, so we now know what species they refer to, even though they're not annotated in the patent. So, for instance, if you wanted to say chimpanzee, and I can't remember the Latin name for chimpanzee, so I go chimpanzee. Oh, there it is, pantroglodytes. Thank you very much, scholar. Um, 
So we have read ahead that actually tells you the species. You go search, and now what you can do is look at every single patent that we've been able to mine that has chimpanzee sequences disclosed within it. But you can also do something kind of cool. You can say, only show me those that are granted patents. Quing, bang. And then we can look at those patents. We can also do is look at the ones where the, where the, the sequence is cited in the claims, which is hardly any of them. So in the biological search, you can do fascinating things on this. You can do sequence and patent data sets by cutting and pasting your own sequence and look for similarities and alignments. You can actually search for, let's say, chimpanzee and uh, AIDS Oops, in the full text of anything that has sequences in it. So now what you'll find, if I hit search button, is 7,002 mm -hmm. patent documents. Not all of them are patents. Most of them are not, uh, which have the words chimpanzee and AIDS and also disclose a protein or DNA sequence, okay? And you can go through these by any of a variety of means. Uh, you can actually immediately look at 17 sequences that are in that one. Bang, there they are. And discover whether they're in the claims or not. None of these are. Okay, that's always nice to know because that means it's teaching but not restricting, at least not in this uh, document. So this is an enormously powerful tool to actually have an evidence driver for policy and genetic resource utilization. Uh, there is more heat and less light in that field than almost anything I can think of. Huge amounts of rhetoric going on about genetic resource access to materials, to influenza, to whatever else. Um, this, I think, will generate an evidence base where we can actually make sensible evidence-driven policy, which we have never been able to do in the innovation system. Doing it in science isn't enough. It's really about science as it applies to products and service delivery to people. So I think this is going to be very useful, uh, Mary, in your field of activity. If you were to imagine getting a couple more people into policy curious to start looking at genetic resource policy as it implies, as it potentially imposes uh, policy restrictions. So anyway, we want this as a public service so people who in policy can make thoughtful and uh, supportable uh, decisions. So some of these are really quite scary, but not many. So just in terms of chemical patent searching, yeah. um, when I was in Peter's group, we actually started to do the development of a tool uh, that would allow you to match that up to basically Marcuse just match that up to the specifications in the text. Wonderful. And it can enumerate, it can enumerate the structure. So I mean, later on, I put in touch with Peter, and it was developed a fabulous PhD student, a client called David Jessup. And, and the work product is in what form? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's. You lie like a rug. You serious? Yeah. Ah, uh, carry my um, children. The, 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 the important point, though, is this. So we found when we were, when we were What was the organization? It wasn't with CSRO, was it? No, no, this was, this was, was the first session. Oh, wonderful. Before the so oh, and I was working with, P with Peter Murray Rust? Yes. Oh, see, the very guy I was talking about. Wonderful. Um, so the real issue, though, is, that we found is that certainly in a, chemi in, in, in a chemical space, patterns are quite often written to ultrasound. Of course so they are. Uh, and the average structure that we looked at, and we were looking at this in the context of numeric materials, but the Marcuse structure for a polymer or poly polymer macromolecule would usually elaborate to 20 odd million discrete, distinct structures. Mm -hmm. So then the challenge becomes finding out what is actually what actually is it that's being protected and right. what is just there to so it's just it's no easy that, answer to that. It's right. hard. But it's computational. That, yes, it's computational, but just the fact that you can read it, you can elaborate the structures, still mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can necessarily extract Not yet, knowledge you can. out of it without a lot of additional... Parenthetically, there have been several efforts. Uh, there's a company called SureChem uh, that evolved out of a New Zealand company called Real2. does a pretty good job of building alternative databases such as that in parsers. The challenge is that each of these entities that does this, because they don't make it open source, they never actually have the advantage or, in fact, the capital to improve them substantially. So the companies that I've spoken with, in the fairly substantial companies, ranging from large companies like BASF and DuPont through to drug companies, are deeply frustrated themselves by the tools that they have at play. They don't actually need to have proprietary tools. They need to have proprietary outcomes. The searches are their, are their business, because it says a lot about where they're going by anyone knowing what they're asking. So there's a huge goodwill in the makers. There's basically two kinds of companies in the world, the makers and the selective deniers, those who can actually do stuff and those who actually provide a gatekeeping to the doability of things. That's like, you know, Thomson Reuters. So most companies would actually share the frustration of the public sector in the quality of the tools available, but until there's a common cyber infrastructure they can work to, uh, we can't build better software. 
So building, uh, for instance, there's nonprofit like ACS that actually makes it incredibly difficult to do that. Um, NCBI at the U.S. National Institute of Health is an incredible organization. I just love them. But they are under great political oversight because of the nature of the U.S. political process, and they can't do anything that disruptive. PubChem is already pushing the limits. So this, we think, can also foster a remarkable resurgence of capability, even amongst the goodwill of very large chemical companies that need the tools, but don't necessarily need to keep them to themselves, just their outcomes. So I'm really optimistic to follow up with, with the thoughts of this, 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 uh, this coder and a lot of the other people in the community and, and, and build it to this. So we're making all the XML calls deep. I mean, all these documents will be available with pretty well-documented APIs, so it doesn't have to go through our servers necessarily. Can I ask? Uh, I agree. Of course, patents are. Really We've got to start with that before you get me. I, okay. Well, this is very exciting. Um, <laughs> what? The, the, no, 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 not about. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I'm waiting. The, I was I'm going to say that everyone will agree that reading patents is absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. but, but something nice about patents is that they actually use a fairly structured vocabulary and they use a very limited vocabulary. So, are you thinking about using natural language processing to be able to? When Mary O'Kane introduced uh, the, the session here, she alluded to the fact that we've recently formed an alliance, a real substantial alliance with NICTA. So I'm going to become a, uh, a principal researcher, seconded back with Cambia, and Cambia and NICTA are forming a joint uh, activity around the lens. Amongst the things we're doing, and this is, please don't report on this, this is not, this is in progress, okay? Uh, we've got a tripartite agreement drafted between NIH, NHMRC. Okay, well. <laughs> Oh, well, okay, well, what I got to say is we're working towards a relationship that will involve PubMed Central being resident in Australia with the entire background XML of all of the documents of the, the largest open access repository on the planet uh, available to start doing machine learning. So one of the things you have to do to do machine learning is have a large corpus of structured data. Well, the patent, is, patent corpus is the largest there is, uh, but when you add PubMed Central, it's the largest scholarly literature resource there is. So we think with NICTA's help, which has some of the best machine learning people and natural language processing people in the world, we should be able to do exactly as you say. And a, a reason I'm, I'm optimistic about that is a conversation I had about eight years ago with uh, Larry Page. At the time, he was accessible. He was no longer Larry Page. He was just Larry Page. And um, I had a conversation with him about, about patents and the possibility of using the very tools you're describing to understand, parse, and, and, and present the meaning of claims. Patent claims are the most structured part of a patent. I mean, there's lots and lots of boilerplate throughout a patent, but the claims are intensely structured because they're also the one important defensible part of the patent. Um, <laughs> though I think we'd agree much of them, many of them are indefensible morally. But that is so structured, so nested, so built in hierarchical language that it's, he was looking at that and he just had this, this funny grin in his face. He says, what you just described to me is what I do for a living. It's exactly what lends itself to uh, information systems uh, assistance. But of course, it's not in the best interest of any of the practitioners to do that because they are the clergy. They, you just, you know, the Franciscans got boiled in oil for trying something like that. It was just not really on. If you remember the clergy having a heresy, so this is a public heresy where we're going to do exactly as you say. Hopefully, well, we aren't. The community will, based on this. So yes, we will turn it into plain language. We'll probably have a little switch that shows lawyers and a little red line through it. Click it, and it, and it translates a patent from bullshit into something that's appropriately, meaningfully disclosed where the claims will be translated into human talk. Now, it's not legally defensible human talk, but it gives you a sense of what it's trying to claim, what it's trying to teach, or not to teach. Those are great ideas, both of you guys, uh, and, and I think it's optimistic that, that those questions are being raised here. The question for you was, um, when it's launching, if you're thinking Yes. But it's only the vaccines. It's not pharmaceuticals. That's OK. OK. I mean, and it's publicly available now, just so we don't brag about it, because it's formatted so poorly. And Michonne did a really good job on it, though she's probably aged 10 years having to interact with software engineers and no intermediate. Uh, yeah.
very short technical question. Are you also interested in document summarization? Yeah. Tools? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, parenthetically, Nick <laughs> Nickta has some great stuff on that too, but I'd love to hear of anything beyond it. I'm really um, excited. Uh, Stephen Wan, CSRO, has a wonderful, already applied to the biomedical literature. So what it does is it, as you read a paper, follows the cross, it follows the cross references when, and the citations in the paper. Will uh, summarize them by machine so that you can um, give you a little mouse over, if you will, so that you can quickly determine whether it's worth you going to reading the whole paper and so on. So sounds lovely. Great. But of course, if it's I'll CSIRO, it may well mean that the new culture of CSIRO imposes its its will on that. But if it's if it's open source or if the philosophy is that talking never hurts, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of my listeners have had a different point of view. Okay. Okay, so feel free to look at the URL. Please don't pass it around. All of you, in the, if there's anybody actually watching on the web, please don't pass it around. Use it yourselves, but it's not ready for prime time. R Richard, yeah. just one more uh, before yeah. you, you go. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is currently being negotiated, and that's a trade-related agreement um, covering countries in the Pacific Rim. And the Melbourne round of negotiations is taking place uh, between March 1st and March 9th. And it seems to me that in terms of intellectual property, um, the imposition of your fantastic patent map as a tool in which to um, make it easier for um, people to obtain this sort of ready information um, would be a real boom. Because I mean, it's about trade liberalisation. That's essentially what the TPPA is about. And in, when it, but when it comes to patents, the inability to access this information through government-funded uh, patent sites, I mean, really, if it wasn't for Richard's um, fantastic search engine, I mean, I'm talking about the current system, not, not this improved system. Um, without that, it, it would be very, very difficult. So uh, I'm just wondering, Richard, is there any chance that you might um, get in touch with the... Uh, the USTR or the, or the DFAT negotiators, are they interested in actually trying to work um, together collaboratively with you to produce something like this and actually embed it into these agreements? So we have something that makes sense. When we have, when we have a, a credible platform that's robust, uh, that's past a beta, I want to do that sort of thing. Uh, I'm afraid of losing credibility with policymakers that have huge pressures on them to have decisions made. And if, if the facility, I mean, some evidence is better than no evidence, but awareness of the lack of evidence is better yet than only some evidence, because right? then you can be cautionary. What worries me is people thinking that this is comprehensive when it's not yet. A lot of work to do. So I, that is, is my intention is to, to wed this into policy at a very, very substantial level. But an example of why this is a problem is that we still have a lot of, as an example in your field, sequences to, to mine from these and to be able to parse what they really mean in terms of the scope of the claim. So we've got it so we can actually look and change it in the language of the claims to ping it into the rest of the world. But there's a lot to be done. So I don't want to rush on that. I want to keep the dialogue open. So we have a terrific working relationship with many patent offices, with, with WTO and with TRIPS, and we talk about it all the time. So my advisory council involves, as you know, Tony, uh, a friend of ours who's the head of the TRIPS Secretariat, uh, involves Francis Gurry from WIPO, it involves the heads of many patent offices, including Brazil and many of the, the new emerging big offices. But I don't want to get sucked into that too much. This can be done autonomously without a lot of government money. Um, I'm happy to take government money as long as they understand this is a public good. So, the government's a little more complicated. Thanks, thanks a lot. If anybody wants to contact me, I'll leave this.